Why is the Bible, why is the Bible different from any other book? That's the question I'm going to put to you. Just think about that just for a few moments. Yep, think about that for a few moments. Why is the Bible different from every other book in the world? Including every other holy book in every other religion. Talk about that in a second. On the board here, we've got 13 things that the Bible says about itself that it actually is. Right? So the Bible says... In Ephesians 6 verse 17, in Hebrews 4 12, it calls itself the sword. The sword of the spirit, you know, the sword, it's the word of God. And then, um, so you've got the sword, you've got the hammer, Jeremiah 23, 29. You've got the seed, so it calls itself seed. 1 Peter 1, 23, it talks about the incorruptible seed of the word of God. Incorruptible, it cannot perish. It calls itself a mirror, James 1, 22 to 25. It's the only book in the world that you read and it reads you. You look into it and you see yourself. It's an incredible book. The more you get into it, the more filthy you realise that you are. It's an incredible book. So it's a mirror. It's a fire. Jeremiah 23, 29. Jeremiah 20, verse 9. It's a fire. It's a lamp. Psalm 119, verse 105. It's apples. Proverbs 25, verse 11. It's milk. 1 Peter 2, verse 2. It's meat. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 2. I've missed out one, which I'm going to ask you in a second. It's honey, Psalm 19.10. It's nails, Ecclesiastes 12.11. And it's water, Ephesians 5.26. You have everything there, we've said, right? Everything there that you could survive on in the jungle, in the forest, anywhere. Because you've got, the, you've got um, nails, you've got water to live by, you've got um, a fire to keep yourself warm and cook, you've got a mirror... Those of you that are ladies, no, I'm only joking, signalling, all that kind of stuff. You've got seeds to plant, you've got a hammer, and you've got a sword to fight with. Your only offensive weapon is the word of God, which is the sword. Something's missing here, which we're going to focus on tonight. Does anybody know what that is? Salt. Salt's a great um, guess. It's a very, very good guess. It isn't, but it could be. I'm not even saying that it's not there. If you find salt, that'd be a good one to add to it. But that's a very good one. But no, it's not salt I've got down there. There's a prize for anybody that gets it. Iron. Iron's another very good. Iron sharpeneth iron. That's another very, very good one. Yep. Yeah. Um, man, alive, you can get two points for that, I think. Um, but that's not the one. There's a young lady down there. She's gone. <laughs> You're going to kick yourselves when you know. It's the most obvious one, or one of them. Spirit, no. No. It's got to be tangible. Light. Light is another very good one, um, but no, because you've got the lamp there. Something else. You're not allowed to because you've done this too many times. It's not blood, is it? Blood, no. It's on the back table. Bread. Bread. Right. Right. Bread. I'll write that in. Bread. And that's Matthew 4.4. 4. Bread, Matthew 4.4, 4. and that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. Now, and that's Matthew 4, verse 4. <clears throat> it's an incredible book, right? This is amazing. What I'm going to show you now is amazing. Um, how many books are in the Bible? 66. 66. Ah, but you're not counting the Apocrypha. No. Is that in the Bible? No, it's not. So we know, we know that the Apocrypha is not inspired, it's not in the Bible. And um, when they originally put it in, they put it in between the two Testaments, showing that it wasn't the inspired word of God, they use it as a historical book. It's not in the Bible, it's a complete waste of time, personally speaking, not even worth reading. But, this, this book, the Bible, 66 books. Now, the Bible, like, um, interprets itself... It tells you what it's like, like the sword, hammer, seed, etc. It tells you itself. And it also tells you in the Bible how many books should be in the Bible. So if they added one, or if they added 14, like the Apocrypha, or whatever, right, it's wrong. Now, this is incredible, I'm going to show you. You have a mini Bible within the Bible. And that's found in a book called Isaiah. Isaiah. Excellent. Isaiah has how many chapters? 66 chapters. Now, this is mind-blowing. Look at this. Turn to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2.
Now, if you went through Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1 is Genesis, Isaiah chapter 2 would be Exodus, Isaiah chapter 3 would be Leviticus. Do you understand what I'm saying? So each, each is a mini Bible, so every chapter represents the book, the books in the Bible. Now, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2, somebody read that aloud. Hear all heavens and deep the earth, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have died against me. Hear, O heavens. Where do you find out about the creation of the heavens? In what book? Genesis. Isn't that interesting? So Genesis, straight away in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 2, you've got the heavens. Talks about in the book of Genesis. Turn to the last book of Isaiah, Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66 represents what book in the Bible? Revelation. Revelation. Last book in the Bible, the 66th book in the Bible, Isaiah chapter 66. Look at verse 22. Somebody read it. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will Is that incredible? Yeah. New heavens, new earth. Where do you find that in the book of Revelation? Now, what's the th- what is the 40th book of the Bible? Shout it out. Matthew. So turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 3. Somebody read that. Who's... Who's that talking about? It's talking about Jesus, and he's talking about the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. John the Baptist. Where do you find that? In what book? Matthew. The 40th book in the Bible is Matthew. It's the 40th chapter in Isaiah. Don't you think that's incredible? That's not there, but that's divine inspiration. You think over 40 writers, a period of 15, 1600 years, not one contradiction, and I'm just giving you just three illustrations. There are loads. There are loads in the book of Isaiah. Showing you again that there's only 66 books that are part of the canon of Scripture. Not 61. You're a darts player. 66 plus 14. (laughs) The pressure's on me, I don't want to. 66, 76... 80. So, 80. <laughs> you put you on the spot there, didn't I? 80. It's only because I couldn't work it out. I was trying to do it myself. Um, <laughs> blame somebody, it's always you. Uh, 80, right? So the Apocrypha is not part of inspired canon of Scripture. Now, here's something mind-blowing. That's interesting. That's cracking. But look at this. Turn. In fact, what's your Bible called? This is called the what? Shout it out. Don't be scared. The King... Latoya's all scared of me. I don't know why. She ain't when the microphone's off. (laughs) King James Bible. Let's turn to the book of Kings. 1 Kings. 1 Kings. Now, when we talk about biblical numerics, yeah, that's one of the reasons that you know, you know, that this book is different from every other book. Because... The, the number pattern in scripture, we've done this on the website, I've told you this before, the number pattern in scripture, it's incredible. It talks about, like they talk about septenary design, the number seven, is significant all the way through scripture. Biblical numerics, it's an incredible thing. The number one, do you remember when we did this? Some of you weren't here for this, so you won't know, but number one represents what? <sighs> Unity. Number two is division. Number three is the Godhead. Number four? The world. Number five, death. Number six, the number of man. Number seven, perfection, completion. Remember Psalm 12, 6 and 7. Perfection, completion, talk about the word of God. Number eight, listen carefully. Number eight, new beginnings. So when you see the number eight in scripture, oftentimes, especially with regard to Noah, eight. Number nine, fruitfulness. King James. How many letters? How many? Nine. Nine. Interesting, isn't it? AV 1611. One plus six plus one plus one. How many? Nine. Isn't it interesting? King. Anyway, 
<laughs> number 10 is the number of Gentiles. Number 11, judgment. Number 12, Israel. Yeah? So, every, so, all, so biblical numerics, and it goes on and on and on. There's different ones, like 50 in Jubilee and things like the thousand year reign, the millennium, this type of thing. So biblical numerics is very important in scripture. Now, tying all that together, we're saying, why is this book different from every other book? You'd say, obviously, pro- prophecy as well. Prophecy is a big one. But here, in the book of Kings, 1 Kings, chapter 8, 8 is the number of new beginnings. How many verses? Shout that out. 66 verses. Now, this is interesting. The eighth day, he sent the people away and they blessed the king and went unto their tents, joyful and glad of the heart for all the goodness that the, the Lord had done for David, his servant, and for Israel, his people. Now, we'll come back to that in a second. Turn, right, so keep your finger in there, turn to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 24. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 5 and 6. Somebody read it. Come on, folks. Help me out. Don't tell me you don't know where Leviticus is. You can all go home if you don't. Uh, 5 and 6. Leviticus, what was it? 24, 5 and 6. How many cakes? Twelve. Keep going. Two ten deals shall be in one cake, and thou shalt set them in two rows, six on a row, upon the pure table before the Lord. Right. The only reason Manjit read that is because she is a baker. <laughs> she can cook. She can cook cakes. She knows what she's talking about. Listen, there, did you see that? There's something significant there. We're looking at one Kings eight. Verse 66, 66 there. Then we turn to Leviticus 24, 5 and 6. 12, significant. And verse 6 says, Thou shalt set them in two rows, six on a row. Six on a row. Six. How about that? 66. There's something inbuilt into this book that tells you How many books are going to be in the inspired word of God? Now, six loaves side by side, for instance, like the 66 books of the Bible. Now, Matthew 4.4, which we missed out here, it was talking about the bread. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. The word of God is like synonymous with bread, right? We sing that song, break forth, you know that song, break forth the bread of life. You You know the hymn. We're looking at the Word of God. Now, I found this out today by accident, but perhaps the Lord is leading here. Now, we've said before, when we looked at the number 666, um, uh, when we looked at Joshua 6, verse 6, Joshua being the sixth book, and that was significant, talking about the tribulation, what happens with the people that are caught up before rapture. Mind-blowing verse. Look at the one before that. Now, here... Look at John 6, verse 66. Just for a second. John 6, verse 66. Somebody read that, please. I've got a lot going on, so you're going to have to help me out with the reading. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They were anti-Christ. They went away from him. They didn't want to walk with him anymore. It was too much for them. He preached. They didn't want to know anymore. They were anti-Christ. Where do you find that? John 6, verse 66. Now look at John 6, verse 66. 33. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. The what? The what? Bread of God. The bread of God. Now, where do you find that? We're talking about biblical numerics. I just found this one out, right? Just tonight, just looking at a concordance. John 6, verse 33. 3 plus 3 is what? There you are. You've got 66 again. 60, there's something built into this book that tells you it's not 61 books in the Bible, there's 66. There's not 80 books, including the Apocalypse. There's 66. There's something about the bread, there's something about 
the, um, the word of God, something about the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you following me on this? Yes. There's something quite amazing about this book. Right. Now, also, uh, can you read 30, uh, in fact, John 6, verse 35 and 40, I also talked about Jesus Christ being the bread. But notice here, right? This, I get so excited, I get overwhelmed by all this stuff, because I've got so much to, I want to share with you tonight, so you're going to have to bear with me. Go back to 1 Kings 8. 1 Kings 8. Verse 66. The eighth day is that day that begins after the millennium. In the sense of, if you turned... I'll read this to you, but if you turn to 2 Peter, 2 Peter 3 verse 8, it says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. This verse, right, defines a prophetic system of millennial days. A day is a thousand years. It's prophecy. 6,000 days full of sin, war and death. And then the seventh day is the millennial rest, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. So he comes back, we're waiting for the rapture, the rapture happens, seven year tribulation, we come back with the Lord, he sets up his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven on earth, physical, literal, Davidic, Jewish kingdom on earth, and then after that, the millennial, after, you know, at the end of the millennium, don't they, the, the, the Satan's let loose and they go after him again. Then after that, you have the new heavens, get it? New heavens, new earth, the eighth day, eighth being the number of new beginnings. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that incredible? So new beginnings. So you've got in 1 Kings 8, the eighth day is the day that begins after the millennium, millennium since the millennium is the seventh day, 2 Peter 3, verse 8. Um, the eighth day is the new heavens and new earth, 2 Peter 3, 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. The eighth day is the new heavens new earth. They show up in the book of Revelation. And Revelation is the book, um, book 66 in your King James Bible. So 1 Kings 8 66 also determines that there are only 66 books that are inspired and you, if you have a copy of the A.V. King James, the oracles are given to the Jews. Jacob is the Jewish name for James. King James is a Jewish book all over. It's stamped with it. Something absolutely incredible is we said that um, Psalms 12, 6 and 7 for the word of God is purified seven times. Completion, perfection. Genesis 1 verse 1 in the Hebrew, the Masoretic text, has seven words. Seven words. Completion, perfection. And th then when it was translated into English, given to the, Eng the, like the English being the English speaking world, Gentiles, non-Jews, the number of the Gentile is what? Ten. How many words are in the first verse? Ten, mind-blowing, mind-blowing. There's something special about this book. You, the Quran is like a comic compared to this. This is put together so intricate detail, it is mind-blowing. You will never find stuff like that in any other holy book in the world. I found that fascinating. Right, so this book is like no other book. Turn to Genesis 1, verse 1. I'm going to get so loud tonight, I'm going to be competing with Zara. <laughs> Genesis 1, verse 1. Somebody read it loud. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, if you have heavens, plural, you have a perverted Bible. So it must be singular. That's a key to understanding whether you've got a copy of the true, perfect word of God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In Genesis 1, verse 1, you find all the elements of science summed up. Straight away, in the first verse of scripture, you have time, beginning. You have space, heaven. You have motion, created. You have matter, the earth. You have energy, God created. So you've got time, space, motion, matter, energy in verse 1 of the Holy Bible. This book is more up to date than your physical world that we used to use at school. This is amazing. The Bible doesn't try to prove there is a God. 
It declares God from verse 1. In the beginning, God. It doesn't try and prove there is a God. It declares that God is always been, has been. He is always. That's why when they said, what, um, when Moses said, what shall I tell them? Your name is. And he says, I am. I am. That's incredible because Jesus takes the same title. Jesus Christ takes the same title. I am he. Isn't that incredible? I am. He's God. Jesus Christ is as much God as the Father. So there's no argument. In Psalm 14 verse 1 it says, The fool hath said in his heart there is no God. You are a fool if you say there is no God. You know, the, the imprint of God is all over the universe. And it's, it's all over this book. The God's handprints, the fingerprints are all over this book. Man's rejected God, he's dismissed God, he's made out that God's not there. And he's, brought, he's even brought God down to his own level as, a, as a, um, a figure, a statue, an object. How on earth can you have a religion where you serve and worship an elephant? Or a pig? Or something like that? So it's crazy. Um, Again, if you look at Romans 1, verse 18 to 32, we won't there. Uh, that will just tell you uh, just a, amazing stuff there in regard to how, what man has done with God. And it says that he, God, has, um, God has rejected man and g- given him over, isn't it? What does it say? Um, given him up, given him up, given him over, given over. God wants, uh, the man wants it so bad, sometimes God will allow him to have it, to teach him a lesson. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Professors, saying that there is no God. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Jeremiah 10, 14 is a great verse. Jeremiah 10, 14. Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder, founder, foundry, is confounded by the graven image. That's what a foundry does, makes these graven images. For his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. There's no breath in them. They're falsehood. Put stick in a statue, and listen, they stick statues of Buddha <laughs> in a garden and make out that it's going to bring peace. Weeds still come up. <laughs> you still have to weed the garden. Sticking a fat bloke in the garden doesn't do any good whatsoever. <laughs> oh dear. Anyway, get back to Genesis 1. Genesis 1. I was speaking in Chester once and we were in this, um, we were preaching this, uh, this meeting and there's a, a real rough, rough blokes there was that were coming in. And it was a bit of a drop-in centre and all these rough blokes in. And a guy called Lawrence comes in. And uh, he's a really, really arrogant bloke. And I'm, I'm right in the swing of things. And um, as I'm going, I'm saying about these false gods and, and he goes, What about Buddha, man? And I says, what about Buddha man? And he says, do you want to fight? This is in the middle of my sermon. Do you want to fight? I said, look, let me finish the sermon first, then afterwards we'll go outside and have a fight. And he goes, all right then, mate. Like this, any sermon I could just carry on. Anyway, getting back to this, right? Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. God created. Now, in regard to that created, look at... Ephesians 3, verse 9. Incredible verse. Ephesians 3, verse 9. Somebody read it to me, please. And to make all men see what the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now, this, give me that end bit again. From the beginning, here we are, at the beginning. Which from the beginning of the world have, hid, sorry, have been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. God created all things by Jesus Christ. So here, in the beginning, God created by Jesus Christ. So you've got God the Father, God the Son, and look at verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit, capital S. Do you know what you've got in verse 1 and 2? You've got the Trinity. When they say the Trinity is a Catholic doctrine, they are mad. The Trinity, from verse 1 and 2, is there. Prevalent, right in verse 1 and 2, you've got the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In verse 1 and 2 of the Holy Bible. Incredible. In regard to the Trinity, look at 
Oh, and then you've got Colossians 1, 14 to 17, which also talks about Jesus creating. Remember that, because it talks about in whom we have redemption through his blood, even in the forgiveness of sins. It goes on to talk about his creation. But Genesis 1, 26, Genesis 1, 26, and God said, let us make man in our image. That can't be talking about, oh, the angels, which is what the JWs say, because you weren't made in the image of an angel. So Genesis 1, 26, Genesis 3, 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us. It's not talking about the angels, it's talking about the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting that the word Godhead occurs how many times in Scripture? Three times. Isn't it interesting that the words Almighty God occur how many times in scripture? Three times. That's amazing. Almighty God occurs three times in scripture. God the Father is Almighty God. God the Son is Almighty God. God the Holy Spirit is Almighty God. Three in one. 1 John 5 verse 7. For there's three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And what do the Christians want to do with their new Bibles? Get rid of the verse. It's the best verse for the Trinity... In all scripture, you're doing yourself no favours by trying to get rid of it. So if you've got a modern perversion like the NIV or something, you've got a corrupt Bible. This book's amazing. This is an introduction for the exciting book tonight. Now, I don't know whether we've run through the forbidden fruit before here with everybody. I can't remember, but me and you were talking about this this, this week. And so this is something I'm going to run past you tonight, and this is incredible. If I said to you what was the fruit that Adam took and ate, and Eve took and ate, what would you say it was? What do we think it is? Some people know this already. The forbidden fruit, what was it? What do most people think it is? An apple. You're taught as a kid that it was an apple. I believed it was an apple. It's incredible. Ken, Ken, what's his name? Um, Ken Ham makes me smile because he says, um, he, when he draws it in his book, he says, um, because nobody knew what it was, he said, we draw it like it looks like a hand grenade. <laughs> Which made me smile. But he's closer, he's closer to what he's saying there than the apple. I'll explain in regard to his drawing. But you can know these things if you dig deep enough. But you'll never get them out of it unless you've got yourself a King James Bible. You'll never find this stuff. So, let's look at just what the Bible says about itself in regard to what the forbidden fruit is. Turn to the book of Numbers. It's wild, man. Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6, verse 1 to 4. You're going to highlight, or I would suggest um, when I overemphasize on a word, highlight it or write it down or underline it. Numbers chapter 6, verse 1 to 4. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the... Listen, here it is. He shall eat nothing that is made of the vine tree. So the vine is a tree. You need to underline that or you need to mark that down. That is critical there. Vine tree for our study, from the kernels even to the husk. So there is one fruit that is forbidden in scripture to eat. And it is a grape. That's what it says in Numbers. We don't even know what it was on the tree of knowledge of good and evil yet. But we know that number six in all of scripture talks about one fruit being forbidden and it is a grape. And it also says that the vine is a tree. You need to know that. The vine is a tree. Not a bush, but a tree. Now grapes and blood are connected. Grapes and blood are connected. Look at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 32, verse 14. Butter of kine and milk of sheep with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats with the fat of kidneys of wheat and thou didst drink, here it comes, the pure blood of the grape. The pure blood of the grape. 
Deuteronomy 32, 14. The pure blood of the grape. Now, let me give you another one. Turn to Matthew chapter 26. So you've got the pure blood of the grape. Grape and blood are connected. Matthew 26. Grape juice and blood are connected. Matthew 26, verse 26 to 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Whenever it's talking about the Lord's Supper, it never mentions wine. It always talks about the fruit of the vine. So if, if in your church that you are using alcoholic wine, you are going against scripture. Because it's unfermented bread, leaven, you know, leaven, unfermented, take the leaven out, unfermented, so it's like crackers, and for the wine, it's unfermented, it's non-alcoholic, because there's two types of wine in scripture, one fermented, one non-fermented, one alcoholic, one not alcoholic, and Jesus Christ never drank alcoholic wine, We'll get to that in a second. And the, the, without doubt, I would say that it is a sin to drink alcohol. But that's another study for another time. But it's on the website if you want to have a look at it. But here, so what I'm saying is that he is drinking this grape juice. And he's saying, this is my blood. So grape juice and blood are connected. Get that first of all. Here's another amazing verse. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 8. Look at this. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine, so there is new wine, is found in the cluster. So where's new wine found? It's found in the cluster. Cluster of what? Cluster of grapes. That's what new wine is. It's grape juice. New wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for, it, for a blessing is, it, in it, is in it. So will I do for servants' sake, that I may not destroy them. So new wine is found in the cluster. New wine is grape juice. Look at this, turn to another amazing verse. Genesis 40. Genesis chapter 40, thank you. I've got some new wine just been delivered. Genesis 40, verse 10 and 11, Genesis 40, verse 10 and 11. And in the vine, remember it's a vine tree, and in the vine were three branches, in, in it, and it was as though it budded, and a blossom sh shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. Listen carefully. And Pharaoh's cup was in his hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup unto Pharaoh's hand. Do you know what that is? That's wine, but grape juice. Like I said, there's wine that is non-alcoholic and there's wine that is alcoholic. Pharaoh here dr uh, drank non-alcoholic wine and it was grape juice. They took the cluster and they pressed it into his cup. I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until I'm in my father's kingdom. So, what I'm, what I'm trying to establish straight away is that there is, there is significance and there is a connection between blood and grapes or grape juice. Isn't it interesting that the, the one here, the grape juice here, it's red. Dark red, just like it was. Blood, looks like blood. Now, something else is forbidden to eat in scripture. Anybody know what it is? Blood. Isn't that interesting? You know, blood is forbidden to eat in scripture. So those of you that eat pig's pudding, solidified blood, you're going against scripture. Now, here... Now, that you, people that say, well, that was before the law. Would you? Listen, listen carefully and write this down if you've never gone through this before. You are forbidden to eat blood before the law. Genesis 9, verse 4. You are forbidden to eat blood during the law. Leviticus 17, verse 14. And you are forbidden to eat blood after the law. The dispensation that you are living in now, Acts 15, verse 20, 28, and 29. So two things, two things are forbidden to eat in Scripture. 
One is blood. I'm not saying that you are forbidden to eat the um, grapes. I'm just telling you, according to scripture, the only fruit that was forbidden is the grape. We'll come to that who can and who can't later. And the other one is blood. And both are connected. (coughs) Now, this is very, very interesting. The first public, public, not private, public miracle that Moses, and Moses is a mediator between God and men. Isn't that interesting? So he's a type of Jesus Christ. Leviticus chapter 1. He's a type of Jesus Christ. So Moses, Moses' first public miracle in the Old Testament was that he turned water into blood. Water into blood. Exodus 4 verse 8 and 9. So now we see that water and blood are connected. Now, he's a type of Christ. Now, the first public, not private, the first public miracle that Jesus Christ did in the New Testament was to turn water into new wine. Grape juice. John 2, 9 to 11. Old Testament, water into blood. Water into grape juice. See the connection. All three are connected. Water, blood and grape juice are all connected. Now, turn here. Amazing verse. 2 Kings 3. 2 Kings. Chapter 3. Verse 22. So the waters were healed unto this day according to the saying of Elisha. No, so that's verse 2. 22. Um, oh yeah, look. And they rose up early in the morning, and the sun shone upon the water, and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as... Isn't that incredible? Red as blood. They saw the water as red as blood. Water, blood, and grape juice are connected. Look at this. Um, Genesis 49. Genesis 49. <clears throat> Verse 10 and 11. This is amazing. <laughs> The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh, that's that's a name for the Lord Jesus Christ as one of his titles, Shiloh come unto, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be, binding his foal unto the vine, vine tree it is, remember, and the ass's colt, unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of Grapes, wine and grapes are connected. He washed his clothes in the blood of grapes. The Lord Jesus Christ, just to say this, I've just written a note here, has seven titles in the Pentateuch, in the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses. He's called the rock, the seed, the scepter, the star, the shepherd, the stone, Shiloh. Seven, there's your seven again. Very interesting. Now, He washed his clothes in the blood of grapes, his garments in wine. Go back to Deuteronomy 32. We'll tie it up in a minute so it all makes sense. But just let me give you the background. Deuteronomy 32, verse 14. We had the pure blood of the grape, which we looked at previously. Now, in Genesis 1.20... There's a verse that speaks of life coming from water. Genesis 1.20. God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature and that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So the birds were made out of the water. Something's coming from water. Life is coming from water. Now, Genesis 2. This is incredible. You have Adam, and you have the last Adam. The first Adam, Genesis 2, 23, we read this. And Adam said, oh, we'll go to verse 22 if you want, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Do you know what you don't have in that verse? Blood. That is significant. Adam had no blood, originally. Blood and water and grape juice are connected. So in Adam's veins, originally when he was made, 
he would have probably had water running through his veins originally until sin happened and then suddenly he took of the forbidden fruit and something happened to his circulatory system where it was turned into blood we'll get to the fruit in a second but it all ties in so well now he had no blood there he is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ the last Adam which is Jesus Christ look at Luke 24 when the Bible talks about blood it writes the word blood Luke 24 verse 39 behold this is the Lord Jesus Christ after his resurrection behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself handle me and see for a spirit hath not flesh and bones isn't that interesting as ye see me have do you know what he hasn't got there blood the last Adam never had blood fantastic isn't it so there's something that ties in here from the first Adam to the last Adam. Lost in a garden, gained in a garden. Incredible. And of course we read in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 50, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. No blood. No blood. You cannot get blood into heaven. Only one type of blood is in heaven. And that's Acts 20, 28, and that's God's blood on the mercy seat, which is Jesus Christ's blood that was shed for us. Acts 20, 28, that's on the mercy seat in heaven. Right. Now, whew, let's take a deep breath and let's go for this next bit. Are you ready? Right. Now, get back into the Garden of Eden. Let's, let's have a look at some trees. Let's have a look at some trees. Hey, up, she doesn't agree. She's walking out. <laughs> Get back into Genesis. Look at this, right? <clears throat> right. Um, Genesis 2.17. I'll say this is the best bit. <laughs> Genesis 2.17. What tree have you got there? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there's a tree in the Garden of Eden called the knowledge of the tree... The knowledge of good, sorry, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the tree. We're trying to find out what that tree is. That's Genesis 2, 17. <clears throat> okay, so that's the tree. We want to find out what it is. Genesis 3, verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sowed, t they sowed what is it? Fig leaves together and made themselves apron. So there was a fig tree in the garden. A fig tree, a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there's also another tree, Genesis 2 verse 9. And of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life. So you've got a tree of life in the garden. These are the ones that are named. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of life, and the fig tree. The three trees there. Interesting, there's three trees. Now, turn to the book of Judges. Judges, chapter 9. <clears throat> Judges, chapter 9. And we're reading from verse 8. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree... We're going to find out what that olive tree is in a second. Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honour God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? And the trees said to the fig tree. So one cancels out the other. You've got a fig tree in Ju Judges 9. You've got the fig tree in the garden. And the tree said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit and go, and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said the trees unto the vine. There it is. Vine tree. Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine which cheereth God and man and go to be promoted over the trees. Then said all the trees unto the bramble. Now that's interesting because you've got thorns and thistles in um, Genesis, yeah? And you've got a bramble here. So that would cancel that out as well, in the sense of the thorns and thistles and the bramble. 
But here, you've got a vine tree, you've got a fig tree, and you've got an olive tree. Now, let's work up. We've said that the fig tree, Genesis 3, verse 7, the fig tree, matches Judges 9, verse 10. So the fig tree cancels out the fig tree. Now, Genesis 2, 9 is the tree of life. Turn to Romans 11. Romans 11. Verse 14 to 24. Romans 11, verse 14 to 24. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them, for in the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Do you see that? Life from the the dead. We're looking, we want to know what this life, the tree of life, <laughs> represented. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, were, thou being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Then will th- say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. And it goes down to verse 24. For if thou wert cut off the olive tree. You know what you have there? The tree of life is the olive tree. Life from the death. Life from the dead. It's an olive tree. The tree of life. So now, that would only leave one tree... Judges 9 compares scripture with scripture, spiritual with spiritual. So that would leave that the vine tree has to be the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the vine tree produces what fruit? Grapes. So the forbidden fruit was a grape. It's all connected. I'm sure you could go much deeper into that, but it's all connected. They cancel one another out in the book of Judges 9, scripture with scripture, comparing spiritual with spiritual, and they cancel out the olive for the tree of life. The fig tree and the fig tree. The vine tree and the knowledge of good and evil. It was a grape. The forbidden fruit was a grape. Now... That's incredible. Again, this is only something that you would get from a King James Bible that you read in here. Just comparing scripture with scripture. Now, I want to get into this. I know we're struggling a little bit for time, but turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 40. Genesis, chapter 40. Because this is also very wild. Genesis chapter 40. <clears throat> and it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker, butler and baker, had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. Joseph is the greatest type of whom? Jesus Christ. Think about this when you read this. You've got a butler, you've got a baker, and you've got Jesus Christ. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued a season in ward. And they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them, and beheld they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of the Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. And if you have a a wide margin, you want to write Daniel 2, 19-22, and Luke 24, 45, in regard to the interpretations belong to God. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me. And in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and a blossom shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. 
And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said unto him, this is the interpretation of it, the three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner where, when thou wast his butler. But think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into, this, into the dungeon." Hopefully you've got things ringing now. Um, You see similarities here. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said unto Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket there was of all manner of bake, bake meats for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee, and shall hang thee on a tree, and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. And it came to pass that the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler, and of the chief baker among his servants, and he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup unto Pharaoh's hand, and he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted them. Yet... Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgat him. This is an incredible passage. Joseph, the greatest type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here in Genesis 40, Joseph is in jail. While in jail, in verses 1 to 3, two new occupants are introduced. The butler and the baker. And the butler was the king's cupbearer. Verse 11, and Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, I took the grapes and pressed them into... He was the cupbearer. He squeezed the grapes into Pharaoh's cup. So the butler was the cupbearer. And also the baker, verse 17 and 18, uppermost basket, um, there was for all manner of baked meats. So he brought the basket with all these baked meats to, the, uh, to Pharaoh. And Joseph Anson said, this is the interpretation... So therefore, we have Joseph, listen, we have Joseph, a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, in between two prisoners. Thieves, exactly. So it's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ in between two thieves. It's ringing the bells, we're now coming round to this. There is so much type in this, it's mind-blowing. Nobody could write this book. This book, listen, I'm jumping to the end here, this book was written here, what we're reading, this was written 1,000 400 years before Jesus Christ set foot on earth and you have got picture after picture after picture of Jesus Christ. No book in the world can do what this book is doing to you tonight. It's amazing. Joseph was innocent. He had done no wrong. And so was the Lord Jesus Christ. The two elements in Genesis 40 are the two elements of the Lord's Supper. New wine, which we've looked at, the butler, pressing the fruit into Pharaoh's cup, New wine, unfermented, non-alcoholic, and then verse 10, you've got the bread. Do you know what you've got? You've got the bread and the wine. Do you know what's that picture of? That's a picture of the Lord's Supper. Do this till he comes. We celebrate the death. It's the gospel. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Genesis 40, 1400 years before Jesus Christ sets foot on earth. Note, there is a three-day restoration. Listen to this. There's a three-day restoration. Verse 13. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto the place. A three-day restoration of one prisoner. One prisoner lives and goes and gets restored and another prisoner dies. One prisoner goes to heaven and one prisoner goes to hell. So the three-day restoration of one prisoner, verse 13, as the dying thief went back to glory with Jesus Christ three days after the crucifixion. Notice also, a tree is the instrument of death for one of the prisoners. So the unsaved dying thief dies on a tree. Verse 17, he's hung. 19, is it? Sorry, 19. Thank you. 19. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee, and shall hang thee on a tree. That's 19. 
Look at Acts, well, again, perhaps we haven't got time, but if you look at Acts 5, verse 30, Acts 10, 39, and Galatians 3, 13, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Genesis 40, verse 9, he said about him telling his dream. Verse 9, and the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream, behold, a vine was before me. The dream concerns new wine, and this is the new wine of the Lord's Supper, the fruit of the vine, the the wine that was um, pressed into um, Pharaoh's cup. New wine is found in the cluster. So summing up, listen, I'm just summing up a few thoughts from Genesis 40 that tie in with the new wine. Listen to this, and Joseph being a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Genesis 40, you have two prisoners. Two prisoners were in, in prison with Jesus and two prisoners were in prison with Joseph, Matthew 27, 38. One of them is restored and one is cursed. Deuteronomy 21, 23, Galatians 3, 13, and Luke 23, 39 to 43. You can get the CD, play it again, and you can take the scriptures down. Otherwise Mary will say, I'm speaking too fast. <coughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got to get it all in, otherwise you'll be bored. Number three, Jesus is numbered with the criminals, as Joseph was, Mark 15, 28. Both Joseph and Jesus were innocent. Isaiah 53, verse 1 to 8. The wrath of the king is upon the two prisoners as it was upon the two thieves. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Romans 1, 18. Jesus as Joseph was bound. John 18, 12, Genesis 40, verse 3. Jesus as Joseph served the guilty. Joseph did and Jesus did. Genesis 40, verse 4, John 13, verse 1 to 13. Jesus, as Joseph, wanted to know why sinners were sad. That's incredible. Genesis 40, verse 7, and Luke 24, 17. Jesus also wanted to know. Jesus, as Joseph, was able to give an infallible interpretation. Luke 24, 45. And as we've said, the two elements of the Lord's Supper are present. Bread and wine. And the wine of Genesis 40 is the same new wine from the fruit of the vine that we've talked about already. And there are three days between the butler's dream and his restoration, and there are three days between the death and restoration of the penitent thief. Jesus and Joseph were Hebrews. A tree was used for the baker and the impenitent thief. And to think that Genesis, and when we went through this before, I know some of you weren't here for this, but Genesis 37 to Genesis 40. One, I think it is, there's something like 150 pictures, 150 pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ, written 1,400 years before Jesus Christ set foot on earth. No man on earth could write that book. The reason why I give you those little things at the start, that, that we find exciting about the 66 books, and there's only six, because there is nothing like that. That is in a league of its own. There's nothing that can even compare. There is no religion in the world that has a holy book that can compare with the prophecy in the Bible, that can compare with biblical numerics in the Bible, that can compare with the types in the Bible. There's nothing like it. That is why we class ourselves as Bible-believing Christians. We don't change one word. We don't change one letter. I submit to that book. There's a million things, a trillion things in that book I don't understand. I thank God for the small things I do understand. And as we read it, see, when you start correcting that, you become the final authority, the lights go out. You'll never get illumination, and you'll never get revelation. And that is why, that when the Calvinists stop at John Calvin, they are blinded. They're so behind the times. When they don't believe in the thousand year reign of Christ, when it talks about, in Revelation 20, thousand years, six times, and they just can't get it. They can't read English. It's as if the lights have gone out. They don't get, they don't get any more progressive revelation. There's something special about this book. You never correct it. You learn it, you ask the Lord through the Spirit of God to teach it to us and to help us try and understand it. Because all these things come together, it's such an intricate, such a detailed book. Like I said before, you can open it and a child can understand it. A child can read about sodomy and not understand what it's talking about. That's how God writes. He protects the children. And yet if you want the the intricate detail, you go as deep as you can. You go mining into this book and God will give you a nugget. 
a golden nugget found in the English. And that is why, again, I, I totally agree with what some people say. The English is better than the Greek. It, there isn't a gr- the Greek, but it's better than Greek and Hebrew. There's, you'll get more revelation, you'll learn more from the authorised version Bible you ever will going back to any original manuscripts, any original languages. Even just by the biblical numerics to start off with. <coughs> this book is amazing. I get excited when I learn these things. You know, I'm looking at these things and I'm thinking, oh, that's incredible. And I want to share them with you. When I learn something, I share it with you. And that's the same. We, that's what we do with each other. We learn from one another. It's not, we don't want stale things. We want fresh, you know, break forth the bread of life. We want stuff that is fresh. That when we learn something, we pass it on. And it just builds up our faith. And I thank God that he's given us a book that is perfect. And that we can read it, study it, live it, learn it. Preach and teach it and share it with as many people as we possibly can. That's why it's so important to sow the seed of the word of God everywhere. That's why when you go tracting, that's the best thing you could ever do. You're sowing the seed of the word of God everywhere. God waters it. God gives the increase. We're just, like somebody said, we're errand boys. We're just delivery people. We take the gospel. We push it through the door. People think you're mad. People think, one guy said to me, you spend that money on, on printing this stuff. Nobody's interested. Listen, my job is to sow the seed of the word of God. Whether you're interested or not, that's what God has called us to do. Sow the seed of the word of God. The gospel, get it out there. Maybe one person will read it and get saved. I thank God for the people that have got saved through reading the tracts. Not many. Not many over the thousands, the tens and hundreds of thousands that we've given out over the years. Not many get saved. Like you said, nobody come tonight and you give out all these leaflets. Don't be disheartened. Man alive, if, uh, if it was down to numbers, I'd be more disheartened than anybody. You know, you think about all the years that you've given out tracts and you think, oh, you know, why aren't people getting saved? There is no major revival before Jesus Christ comes. It's the day of small things today. No big revival, no matter what the Pentecostals say. Uh, with my friends, didn't you? Ex- ex- excluded that. <laughs> he doesn't think that, I'm sure. If he does, he's wrong. Um, <laughs> no. But listen... He's the soundest Pentecost I've ever met. (laughs) Um, But listen, this is the book. Stay with the book and you won't go wrong.